Welcome back to my channel. So we'll be discussing the facial nerve, which has four components. There is the motor nucleus, which is special visceral efferent because the muscles of facial expression come from the second pharyngeal arch. Then the suprasalivatory nucleus, which has the salivatory and the lacrimal component, and that is parasympathetic, that is general visceral efferent. The nucleus of the tractus solitarius is for taste, and that is special visceral afferent. That is taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Then of the spinal nucleus of trigeminal, which is general somatic afferent, for general sensations coming from the uh, pinna and the external ear. Then you have the phenomenon of what you call the facial colliculus. So the motor fibers coming from the motor nucleus will pass above the abducens nucleus, and this phenomenon here is what we call the facial colliculus. So if you look at that uh, location in the posterior cranial fossa for the facial nerve will be within what you call the cerebellopontine angle. So this is the abducens nucleus within the, so you have the ventral pons, you have the ventral medulla, these are the pyramids, these are the olives. So this is the sit cranial nerve. Then you have the facial nerve here, then this is the vestibular cochlea. In between you have the intermediate nerve or the nervous intermediates. So this is the, these are the motor fibers of the facial nerve. The intermediate nerve or the nervous intermediate carries parasympathetic and sensory branches of the facial nerve. So this area here is known as the cerebellopontine angle because this is a cerebellum, that is the pons. Now the facial nerve will exit the brainstem via the internal acoustic meters. If you look at the motor component of the facial nerve, you realize that the motor nucleus of the facial nerve has a superior part and an inferior part. The superior part gets innervation from the right and the left uh, primary motor area, while the inferior component gets contralateral innervation. That means that if you injure the fibers coming from the cortex going to the motor nucleus, that will be an upper motor neuron lesion or supranuclear, meaning above the motor nucleus. So anywhere from the cortex, corona radiata, internal capsule, midbrain, if you get an injury of those fibers, then you'll only uh, get fibers being injured, the ones that go to the lower part. And so an upper motor neuron lesion will give you upper sparing. So the upper part of the face will be spared. That means the patient can be able to wrinkle their forehead, but the, there'll be paralysis of the lower part of the face. So that is an upper motor neuron lesion. And remember, the lesion will be contralateral because this lower part receives contralateral innervation. So you'll have lower, uh, lower half of the face, the opposite side. In a lower motor neuron lesion, that means inframuclear below the motor nucleus, what you have is the paralysis will be on the same side of the lesion, okay, but it will be complete half of the face. So the whole part of the face will be, uh, will be affected. Now the motor fibers of the facial nerve will pass to the cerebellopontine angle, internal acoustic meters, give off the nerve to stapedius, which if you injure, you get hyperacusis. Then you pass through the stylomastoid foramen to exit the skull, where now it innervates the posterior belly of the gastric, the stylohyde, the posterior auricular. Then it passes through the parotid gland, where now it branches into five branches, which supply the muscles of facial expression. So remember the branches are temporal, zygomatic, Mandi marginal mandibular, then you have the uh, you have buccal, and then you have the cervical branches. So the parasympathetic fibers of the facial nerve will have two main target sites: the submandibular ganglion and the pterygopalatine ganglion. The submandibular ganglion is responsible for the salivary glands, which are submandibular and sublingual. The pterygopalatine ganglion is responsible for the lacrimal gland. So remember these fibers will run within the nervous intermediates. So they'll still pass via the cerebellopontine angle, the internal acoustic meters. Then now here you get the coda tympani, which carries uh, test fibers from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. It will exit through the petrotympanic fissure, go to the infratemporal fossa, where it joins the lingual nerve at an acute angle, and then goes to the submandibular ganglion. Now the greater petrosal nerve is the one that carries the lacrimal fibers. So it passes via the hiatus of the facial canal through the middle cranial fossa, joined by the deep petrosal nerve, which is uh, coming from the sympathetic fibers around the internal carotid artery. 
Then they'll travel to the Terugut Canal, where they get to the Terugut Palatine Ganglion. From there, now you go to, through the zygomatic branch of the maxillary, communicating with the lacrimal branch of the ophthalmic, eventually going to the lacrimal gland. Now, the clinical relevance of the facial nerve is that you have to understand two main concepts, the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. An upper motor neuron is a pyramidal neuron from the primary motor area, specifically for the facial nerve, you're looking at the facial homunculus and the associated corticobulbar tract, which descends via the corona radiata, internal capsule, midbrain to get to the pons. Now the lower motor neuron, motor nucleus of the facial nerve within the pons is the lower motor neuron with the associated facial nerve fibers that exit the brainstem. So if you get an upper motor neuron lesion, that could be due to a uh, stroke involving the middle cerebral artery, tumors within the internal capsule or within the midbrain. A lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve will be stroke involving the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, an acoustic neuroma within the cerebral pontine angle, Bell's palsy, which is idiopathic lower motor neuron palsy of the facial nerve, happy simplex and varicella zoster uh, reactivation within the ganglia of the facial nerve. So remember the herpes viruses usually inhabit the ganglia and the facial nerve has the geniculate, does the pterygopalatine and the submandibular ganglia associated with it. Now during parotid surgery you can injure the fibers going to the face. During facelift surgery you can also injure the fibers of the, uh, the motor fibers of the facial nerve and you can also have temporal bone trauma. If you get a patient who has an upper motor neuron lesion Okay, remember that if you have an upper motor, like for example, a lesion, uh, for example, a, a stroke or bone uh, or brain tumor or trauma to the brain, uh, the level of the cortex, corona radiata, or the internal capsule, what you're going to get is the opposite side of the face, the lower half is the one that's going to be affected. So the, in an upper motor neuron lesion, you get upper sparing. So this upper part of the face will be spared. So it's only the uh, lower half of the opposite side will be affected. So if you get a stroke on the right side, then the left lower half is the one that will be affected. In a lower motor neuron lesion, the same side of the lesion will be affected, but the complete half of the face will be affected. So this is the concept of the facial nerve. And remember, the facial nerve also has other components. It has sensory and parasympathetic that are associated. Now, the motor presentation or the motor paralysis of the facial nerve tends to be the one that uh, is more clinically evident. And that is why we focused uh, on them here. But based on the understanding of the other components of the facial nerve, you can be able to work out the basic uh, presentation if you have a facial nerve injury.